June 8th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, 2 Kings chapter 7 and 8 from the Old Testament. Elisha replied, Hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. About this time tomorrow, a seah of finely milled flour will sell for a shekel, and two seahs of barley for a shekel, at the gate of Samaria. An officer who was the king's right-hand man responded to the prophet, Look, even if the Lord made it rain by opening holes in the sky, could this happen so soon? Elisha said, Look, you will see it happen with your own eyes, but you will not eat any of the food. Now four men with a skin disease were sitting at the entrance of the city gate. They said to one another, Why are we just sitting here waiting to die? If we go into the city, we'll die of starvation. If we stay here, we'll die. So come on, let's defect to the Syrian camp. If they spare us, we'll live. If they kill us, well, we were going to die anyway. So they started toward the Syrian camp at dusk. When they reached the edge of the Syrian camp, there was no one there. The Lord had caused the Syrian camp to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a large army. Then they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has paid the kings of the Hittites and Egypt to attack us. So they got up and fled at dusk, leaving behind their tents, horses, and donkeys. They left the camp as it was and ran for their lives. When the men with a skin disease reached the edge of the camp, they entered a tent and had a meal. They also took some silver, gold and clothes and went and hid it all. Then they went back and entered another tent. They looted it and went and hid what they had taken. Then they said to one another, it's not right what we're doing. This is a day to celebrate, but we haven't told anyone. If we wait until dawn, we'll be punished. So come on, let's go and inform the royal palace. So they went and called out to the gatekeepers of the city. They told them, we entered the Syrian camp and there was no one there. We didn't even hear a man's voice. But the horses and donkeys are still tied up and the tents remain up. The gatekeepers relayed the news to the royal palace. The king got up in the night and said to his advisors, I will tell you what the Syrians have done to us. They know we are starving. So they left the camp and hid in the field, thinking, when they come out of the city, we will capture them alive and enter the city. One of his advisors replied, Pick some men and have them take five of the horses that are left in the city. Even if they are killed, their fate will be no different than that of all the Israelite people. We're all going to die. Let's send them out so we can know for sure what's going on. So they picked two horsemen, and the king sent them out to track the Syrian army. He ordered them, Go and find out what's going on. So they tracked them as far as the Jordan. The road was filled with clothes and equipment that the Syrians had discarded in their haste. The scouts went back and told the king. Then the people went out and looted the Syrian camp. A seah of finely milled flour sold for a shekel, and two seahs of barley for a shekel, just as the Lord had said they would. Now the king had placed the officer who was his right-hand man at the city gate. When the people rushed out, they trampled him to death in the gate. This fulfilled the prophet's word, which he had spoken when the king tried to arrest him. The prophet told the king, Two seahs of barley will sell for a shekel, and a seah of finely milled flour for a shekel. This will happen about this time tomorrow in the gate of Samaria. But the officer replied to the prophet, Look, even if the Lord made it rain by opening holes in the sky, could this happen so soon? Elisha said, Look, you will see it happen with your own eyes, but you will not eat any of the food. This is exactly what happened to him. The people trampled him to death in the city gate. Now Elisha advised the woman whose son he had brought back to life, you and your family should go and live somewhere else for a while, for the Lord has decreed that a famine will overtake the land for seven years. So the woman did as the prophet said. She and her family went and lived in the land of the Philistines for seven years. 
After seven years, the woman returned from the land of the Philistines and went to ask the king to give her back her house and field. Now the king was talking to Gehazi, the prophet servant, and said, Tell me all the great things which Elisha has done. While Gehazi was telling the king how Elisha had brought the dead back to life, the woman, whose son he had brought back to life, came to ask the king for her house and field. Gehazi said, My master, O king, this is the very woman, and this is her son, whom Elisha brought back to life. The king asked the woman about it, and she gave him the details. The king assigned a eunuch to take care of her request and ordered him, Give her back everything she owns, as well as the amount of crops her field produced from the day she left the land until now. Elisha traveled to Damascus while King Ben-Hadad of Syria was sick. The king was told the prophet has come here. So the king told Hazael, Take a gift and go visit the prophet. Request from him an oracle from the Lord. Ask him, Will I recover from the sickness? So Hazael went to visit Elisha. He took along a gift, as well as forty camel loads of all the fine things of Damascus. When he arrived, he stood before him and said, Your son, King Ben-Hadad of Syria, has sent me to you with this question. Will I recover from the sickness? Elisha said to him, Go and tell him, You will surely recover. But the Lord has revealed to me that he will surely die. Elisha just stared at him until Hazael became uncomfortable. Then the prophet started crying. Hazael asked, Why are you crying, my master? He replied, Because I know the trouble you will cause the Israelites. You will set fire to their fortresses, kill their young men with the sword, smash their children to bits, and rip open their pregnant women. Hazael said, How could your servant, who is as insignificant as a dog, accomplish this great military victory? Elisha answered, The Lord has revealed to me that you will be the king of Syria. He left Elisha and went to his master. Then Hadad asked him, What did Elisha tell you? Hazael replied, He told me you would surely recover. The next day, Hazael took a piece of cloth, dipped it in water, and spread it over Ben-Hadad's face until he died. Then Hazael replaced him as king. In the fifth year of the reign of Israel's king Joram, son of Ahab, Jehoshaphat's son, Jehoram, became king over Judah. He was 32 years old when he became king, and he reigned for eight years in Jerusalem. He followed in the footsteps of the kings of Israel, just as Ahab's dynasty had done, for he married Ahab's daughter. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. But the Lord was unwilling to destroy Judah. He preserved Judah for the sake of his servant David, to whom he had promised a perpetual dynasty. During his reign, Edom freed themselves from Judah's control and set up their own king. Joram crossed over to Zair with all his chariots. The Edomites who had surrounded him attacked at night and defeated him and his chariot officers. The Israelite army retreated to their homeland. So Edom has remained free from Judah's control to this very day. At that same time, Libna also rebelled. The rest of the events of Joram's reign, including a record of his accomplishments, are recorded in the scroll called the Annals of the Kings of Judah. Joram passed away and was buried with his ancestors in the city of David. His son, Ahaziah, replaced him as king. In the twelfth year of the reign of Israel's king Joram, son of Ahab, Jehoram's son, Ahaziah, became king over Judah. Ahaziah was twenty-two years old when he became king, and he reigned for one year in Jerusalem. His mother was Athaliah, the granddaughter of King Omri of Israel. He followed in the footsteps of Ahab's dynasty and did evil in the sight of the Lord, like Ahab's dynasty, for he was related to Ahab's family. He joined Ahab's son Joram in a battle against King Hazael of Syria at Ramoth Gilead, in which the Syrians defeated Joram. King Joram returned to Jezreel 
to recover from the wounds he received from the Syrians in Ramah when he fought against King Hazael of Syria. King Ahaziah, son of Jehoram of Judah, went down to visit Joram, son of Ahab, in Jezreel, for he was ill. God, lately I feel like Elisha in this story. Not that I can predict the future, but um, when Elisha's talking to Hazael and he, he knows what's going to happen and his heart is broken, he knows the direction that Hazael's about to take um, and probably is currently taking and he cries. And I'm having a really hard time right now. I have some people in my life who, who are doing that. Hopefully not as drastic as Hazael is about to take. Um, but I can see their potential. I can see the path that you've got them on. I see the incredible people you keep putting into their lives. And I keep watching them sabotage themselves over and over again. Putting, putting themselves in situations to not receive the amazing gifts that you're trying to offer them. The forgiveness, the grace, the mercy. And my heart just hurts. And it doesn't mean I, I don't turn things over to you. I, you already know this. We've already had a lot of conversations about these people. But my heart is just broken as to what I can see happening. But, but just like Elisha was talking about uh, tomorrow... The price is going to be this. And, and the soldier's like, are you joking me? Even God can't make this happen overnight. I do know that you can change people's hearts overnight, God. I do know that you can do dramatic things in their life. Uh, I got to see it over the last couple of weeks with a person. I know we've been praying a lot uh, for their heart. And I'm watching it actually change and change a lot faster than I thought it was going to. Um, and that's just just spectacular. So God, I, I just turn these people over to you. I turn this pain in my heart over to you. And, and, and any control I think that I should have in these situations. And I just pray that the path that you have for them, the people you're putting in their lives, the situations you're putting into their lives, that they would just become very aware and take responsibility for those uh, that they would be intentional of going after that uh, opportunity that you've put in front of them. And that they would see it as a blessing. You know, I watch one of them trip, trip over themselves so fast, running through the list of everything that's wrong in their lives, while completely missing the blessings and peace that you're offering them. God, I, I do know because I've known these people for a long time, most of them a long time, that a lot of this is a result of actions that they've taken in the past. I realize these are consequences, that even if forgiveness is, has taken place, I do know that these are consequences. And I do know sometimes, like you're doing in my life, we have to play out those consequences. There are responsibility for those, those actions and choices we made uh, that went against your will. So I, I fully understand they may need to go through these hard times, but I guess, I guess what I'm asking is while they go through these hard times, can, can you help them see you? Can you help them be joyful even while they go through these consequences? And, and again, some of them are going to have to go through them for the rest of their life. Can they, can you show them what that looks like? It almost seems like the two can't coexist, but I, but I thought that way at one point, and now my life definitely coexists with the consequences of my past choices and my current and future joy of being your child who is forgiven unbelievably by you. God, thank you for watching over these people. I love you very much. In your son's name I pray. Amen.